good afternoon to our in-person and online audience. We're so glad to have you with us. We just finished a wonderful potluck here at Green Lake, and we are so thankful to have Dr. Herr and sharing his wisdom about archaeology. And those watching online, we want to give you an opportunity to interact and ask questions as well. And so we will be putting up a QR code that you can uh, uh, show your phone on and you'll get the link to ask questions. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can just type in in the comments there. And at the end of his presentation today, we'll have a Q&A with those in person and also online. So ask any question and that's what makes these sorts of things especially interesting. The topic for this afternoon is interesting in itself though. Does God have a wife? That's a provocative title, and I'm really excited to hear how Dr. Herr uh, digs into that topic, and I don't want to spend too much time talking myself, so without further ado, Dr. Herr, the time is yours, and we are so thankful to have you with us today. Good. Thank you, Pastor Kevin. Um, before I get into whether he had a wife or not, um, and it is whether, <clears throat> um, I want to give you greetings from someone uh, that was involved with the Green Lake Church way back in the 1980s. Some of you may go back that far. And so Larry and Arlene Downing wanted to send their greetings to you. Um, they are good friends of Denise and Dana's family from way back, I think. Um, and I have become a good friend of uh, theirs as well. Larry and I have done a few things together uh, associated with the Adventist um, uh, Society of Religious Studies uh, teachers. So what, he wanted me to give you all greetings. Did God have a wife? I'm going to give you the evidence. You decide. <clears throat> all right? But I have to introduce Canaanite religion to you at the same time. So this session is going to have a lot of stuff. And it's going to go boom, 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 boom. So please follow me closely. I know it's after the meal. And we are tempted to uh, um, bow our heads a little bit in prayer. But... Um, <laughs> As I told my students, I don't mind if you get up and walk around. Just don't go to sleep because there's a lot that's going to be happening here. First of all, a few biblical texts. There will be quite a few biblical texts with this, but there's going to be a lot of information you haven't heard before. <clears throat> Joshua 24 verse 2 is also a text that archaeologists love, but um, preachers don't often um, talk about very much. It is uh, the, the beginning of Joshua's valedictorian speech after the conquest in Joshua 24 verse 2 when everybody was together. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Long ago, your ancestors, and then he names them, Terah and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, okay, lived beyond the Euphrates, that's in Mesopotamia, and served other gods. Okay? Um, that's a key point. What other gods were these? Did it include the real god or what? Ezekiel 16, 3, way from the other side of the, of the historical spectrum, at least as the books uh, contend. Ezekiel 16, verse 3 says, notice the same phrase, thus says Yahweh, thus says the Lord Yahweh. Very similar here. That's a very prophetic way of introducing something, an oracle, a uh, prophetic oracle, for instance. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, and Lord is the word Adonai, or Lord, okay? I'm going to talk about Adonai a little bit later. Your origin and your birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Yeah, yeah, when you read this, you just think, this was ancient Canaan. They took over the land, that's where they were from. But there's more to this than that. The Hebrew language that they all spoke was actually a dialect of Canaanite language. 
Okay, you get what I mean? A dialect of it. It arose slowly through time, just like our language is evolving through time. Yeah, you think, you kind of think, kind of like of uh, valley speak, like, uh, like the girls do. Dana has a daughter who is really good at this. I should get Leanne up here and, <laughs> and speak like that. Like, uh, but our language is changing. Yeah? And uh, that's one thing I study. I can study the inscriptions in the Bible, for instance, uh, outside the Bible, and see how the language grew and changed through time. Then I can go back to the Bible and look at the biblical language, and I can put that on the, on the uh, continuum of the language we have from the inscriptions, and I can tell more or less when the biblical passages were written by their grammar, by the words they chose, and so on. Um, that's interesting. Writing pottery changes like that. So we're going to go to a time before there was the Hebrew language. We're going to go to a time when it was Canaanite. And we're going to look at Canaanite gods. Hmm. Uh, er er earlier than the Hebrew Bible. We're going to look at a site named, in ancient times, Ugarit. Today it's called Ras Shamra. Ras is the word for head. Uh, Shamra is the name of the headland right here. In fact, you can see kind of um, this ping pong ball is too big, but it, you can see the ancient site right there. I happened to be flying into Amman, Jordan, and the plane went right over this ancient site, uh, Mediterranean Sea, and uh, oh, the mountain separating Syria down here from Turkey, uh, Antioch, just on the other side of the mountains there. And this mountain here was the holy mountain of Ugarit right here. It was called Baal Safon, uh, the Lord. Ba Baal means Lord, the Lord of the north. Safon is the word for north. So we're going to look. Uh, a farmer was plowing his field here in 1929, and all of a sudden, boop, up from his plow, there came an ancient text. Okay? He looked at this. Oh, I could get money for this. And he kept plowing, and boom, others came up. He found something like 20 or 30 of these ancient texts with cuneiform uh, writing. Actually, it was an alphabetic cuneiform, not like the cuneiform of Babylon and Assyria, which was syllabic. Um, it was an alphabet. And uh, so he brought these and sold them on the antiquities market. Scholars knew immediately about this. They studied the texts, found that it was in an ancient Canaanite dialect, okay, uh, and alphabetic uh, writing. Uh, and so um, uh, they became quite famous. Um, I, I will t we'll be talking about Ugaritic inscriptions a lot here. Okay, but first, some books. If you're interested in this topic, um, it's not only I who uh, think that there was a possibility that some uh, Israelites thought God had a wife, but it's, it was, it's very broad among archaeologists today. People in churches don't get to know it because there's so much more that you have to know to understand the background. I'm going to give you a little bit of that. One of the easiest ways is this book right here, Stories from Ancient Canaan, edited by Michael Coogan. He, he was another Harvard grad, and Mark S. Smith, who is now at uh, Yale University. But this is an introduction to Ugaritic literature, the most famous of, of the writings. <clears throat> For instance, it has the whole myth of Baal, the story of Baal, the Baal that is in the Bible so uh, prominently. That's his story. He was the storm god of the people at Ugarit and the main god at Ugarit. There are some historic, heroic stories, like, um, like the heroic stories of uh, Greece and so on, and Canaanite psalms. In fact, um, uh, some of our psalms actually seem to quote from these, uh, from these uh, one or two of these psalms. So this 
he has a long introduction that describes the connection of Ugaritic language and literature to that of the Bible. Okay, and there are many, many similarities. The poetic forms are the same. The word plays are the same. All of this. Even, uh, but more technical, this is semi-popular kind of uh, text. Um, Yahweh and the Gods of Canaan by William Foxwell Albright. Albright was the deed of, uh, of uh, um, uh, archaeologists, uh, Palestinian archaeologists, in the middle of the 20th century, beginning, oh, about 1920 and on up to 1970. So he had a long history. Uh, taught at um, Johns Hopkins University. This is a very technical book, um, using a lot of Hebrew and a lot of Ugaritic and all of that. Um, I read this book as an undergraduate. <laughs> I powered through it. it. Took me a long time, but I learned an awful lot from that book. Um, a student of his, Frank Moore Cross, who was the main professor of Larry Garrity and myself, um, wrote Canaanite Myth and Hebrew Epic, in which he compares the Canaanite stories of the gods with how they were adapted into the Bible, uh, but not as a mythology, but he uh, sees it as epic stories. Uh, so it, it's also a technical book, but instead of looking at specific words or phrases comparing the language, he's looking at uh, broader themes like the divine assembly, uh, the cosmogonic battle, elements of creation, and so on. Larger themes that uh, are in common with Ugaritic and Hebrew literature. Other books, several of them, by a fellow named John Day and Mark S. Smith, this same Mark uh, Smith up there. He has a book called An Early History of God, <clears throat> um, which is quite en enlightening, actually. Um, these are semi-technical, mostly technical. And then one that is really good, written by a Jewish scholar, The Religions, note the plural, of Ancient Israel. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, if this is a technical, uh, archaeological, and linguistic uh, uh, analysis of things. Uh, Tzioni Zevet was uh, a, um, a language, Hebrew language teacher at uh, the University of Judaism in Beverly Hills, <laughs> California. And then finally, th the inspiration for the title of this lecture, Did God Have a Wife, by Bill Deaver, a very good friend of all us uh, Adventist archaeologists. Uh, many of them have gotten their degrees at University of Arizona where Bill uh, taught. He's a very good, good and close friend. Denise and I have visited them, their house in Cyprus and you know, all of that. This is a, this, this is a semi-popular book uh, from whence I took the title of this lecture. Um, all these authors see the broad story and the specifics of what I'm going to present to you today as maybe their interpretations, yes, but they're close to being fact as they see. First of all, I want to introduce you to a god named Ale. We pronounce it Ale, not L, but Ale, okay? It's a long kind of E. Uh, Ale, in the Ugaritic texts, was the head of the divine assembly. In the Bible, there is another divine assembly, sometimes called the sons of Ale, translated as God in your Bibles, as in Psalm 29. But also at the very beginning of the book of Job, where the assembly comes together, and the Satan, I'm pronouncing it like the Hebrew way with the definite article, which the Hebrew always has with this individual. It's a title, not a name. The Satan uh, is part of that assembly. And there's, there's this kind of clapping each other on the back. What have you found, you know, <laughs> in going around? God asks of the Satan. Um, also, at, at the beginning of the Noah story, um, there's uh, talking about these sons of Ale. Okay? He is also the father of the gods. 
He's an old God with a long gray beard, sort of like we think about when we say the ancient of days. Yeah, uh, he's one of the old gods. He is the father of Baal, who's, that's a title for, the, for, for this god. His real name was Hadad. Um, you, Hadad, in the Bible, certain kings, Aramean kings, have that element in their name, Hadad. He was the Canaanite storm god, but he's also the father of Baal's supreme enemy at Ugarit, the sea. Yam. We'll talk a little bit uh, about that animosity between those two, those two gods. Uh, and once you understand that, you can see uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the background to the, why, the, why the Israelites would worship Baal. Uh, Ale was a fertility god symbolized by a bull. Mm. Um, and his female consort was a goddess named Asherah. He is equ equ equated by the Greeks with Kronos, the father of Zeus. This makes sense, right? Ael, the father of the storm god. Kronos, the father of Zeus, the storm god in Greece, the, the, symbolized by the lightning bolt, right? Um, Ale was also an internationally known deity um, over a large area of the Middle East. Most of the Fertile Crescent has Ale as one of their main gods. Uh, it's translated with an I sometimes in some of the languages, with an A in some of the languages. In fact, it's, it has formed the basis of the Muslim name of God, Allah, the al is their way of saying ale. Um, Allah has a case ending on the end too. The Hebrew does not because Hebrew lost their case endings. Except in one instance it came back. So he's an internationally known deity and occurs in lots of names, especially, especially among the Ammonites, but also in the Bible. Num point number seven, the we, talk about a theophoric element. Every ancient name, if it's a full name, had the name of a god in it. Some names are short. They don't have the god name. Those are nicknames <laughs> um, or developed from something else. But for instance, you have Dani Ale, Samu Ale, Ale Kana, the wife of Hannah, father of uh, Samuel, Ail Aija, hmm, Ail Aisha, all of these have meanings. Ail is my judge. Uh, Ail hears one's prayers. Uh, Ail creates. Uh, Ail is Yahweh here for Elijah. And Ail saves right here. So Ail is in ancient Israel as well, very prominently in ancient Israel as a name of God, not just the word God, but a name of God, as we shall see. Uh, and that's what I emphasize in number eight. Number nine is, the, is an interesting one. The most frequent uh, designation for God in the Old Testament is the word Elohim. The im ending in Hebrew is plural. Okay? More than one. Why would we make El here into a plural. The H comes back as the case ending, right? Uh, when you add the, the plural. It, this is one of the most frequent words in the Old Testament, thousands of occurrences. Um, yeah. Um, but, wherever it is used in the Old Testament, if it's the subject of a verb, even though Elohim is plural, the s verb is singular. Hmm. So they thought of Elohim, maybe the word was plural, but they thought of Elohim as singular. Very important concept here. Why did they use that plural? Was, uh, Ael was identified with Yahweh throughout the Old Testament. In fact, they become interchangeable. Okay, um, That is necessary to understand for what's going to happen next. So I'm going to introduce Asherah here. Ale's wife. 
He's, she's the wife of Ale in the Canaanite literature of Ugarit, extremely prominent. She's the only one who can really argue with him when they have a debate. Baal wants a temple, but he doesn't want to build a temple for Baal. Asherah convinces him she, he should. She is a goddess of fertility, like he is a god of fertility, she is the goddess of fertility and the mother of all the gods. She's symbolized by both two things, a lion or especially a tree of life. The tree of life is the most uh, uh, frequent iconographic symbol in the ancient world, in the ancient Near Eastern world. <clears throat> Trees of life everywhere. She and her symbols are some of the most frequent iconographic, yeah, okay, that's, um, and we will see some of these. She becomes prominent in Israel during the time of the kings. How do we know? Because we actually have her name in the Old Testament about 30 times. However, when people were translating the Bible early on, and this includes the early Greeks when they translated the Bible from the Hebrew into Greek, the Septuagint, uh, they didn't know what Asherah was. And so they did a word study of it in context. And in places they cut these uh, Asherahs down and burned them. So they said, well, this is wood. And so they translated it as groves of trees. <laughs> when Gideon hews down the Asherah, it's actually groves of trees. You may think of it that way, but it's actually the word Asherah that is there. Okay, what was Asherah like? Um, <clears throat> As a fertility goddess, she's frequently depicted feeding animals. Here are two goats standing on the side, and she's got wheat or barley uh, heads of uh, grain and feeding them to these uh, goats. She's often depicted, I can speak this way in this audience it looks like, uh, with uh, exaggerated sexual attributes. <clears throat> um, uh, sometimes she's depicted in reality like that as a, a, as a woman doing this deed of feeding. Sometimes it's just the tree of life that's doing, that the goats are eating out of. We'll see some of uh, those pictures as well. Um, here is a jug from the city of Lachish. This was the, a Canaanite city when this was found, but uh, from about 1250 B.C. before the uh, Israelites took it over. Um, we can see, do you see a goat here? Do you see horns going back? A head right here, the front, uh, front two legs, back two legs, tail right like, like that? You see that? On the other side is a corresponding goat. You see the horns, the head, the front of a goat. In between is a stylized tree of life shaped like a, a candlestick, a menorah, again, like we uh, saw last night. And an inscription above which reads, this is dedicated to Baalat, uh, or the lady, lady Baalat, the feminine of Baal. Um, Baal would be Lord, Baalat would be Lady. So there's an example of this uh, Asherah uh, being a tree of life, because um, Baalat is one of her titles. <clears throat> here from Egypt, and uh, Egypt doesn't often talk about Asherah very much, but here, look at this tree giving breast to uh, Pharaoh Tutmos III as a young boy. So this would be dated around four, 1400 BC, right here. So in the next section, we have Ale and we have Asherah. Does Ale equal Yahweh? I've already mentioned that this is in, these names are interchangeable. I'm going to give you evidence for that right now. If true, Ale equals Yahweh, what are the implications? Well, there's overwhelming evidence, actually. But first, I want to get back to Ale as the Bible uses the name, okay? In Exodus 6.3, uh, uh, Moses is back in Egypt now, and he is preparing to take the people out of Egypt. And God speaks to him. He says, 
He says, you know, introduces himself, I am Yahweh. But then he says, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the three patriarchs early on before anybody went to Egypt, right? As Ael, but it's not just Ael, it's Ael Shaddai, okay? We have a song children like to sing. It's called Shaddai, I think. People mistakenly see it as a name. It's a title. It doesn't just occur in the Bible. It's very frequent in the Ugaritic literature, used with ale. And here in the Bible in Exodus 6.3, the very same name of God, ale, and the title Shaddai is used. But by my name Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. So God tells Moses that. Uh, he says, I was not known as Yahweh earlier than what I told you. And the, and the next slide will show you where that uh, uh, happened, where in, God introduced his name as Yahweh to Moses at the burning bush. In, in the uh, patriarchal stories and a few of the others, we see Ael's name used with several titles. Okay, almost like Greek names could be Zeus Olympia, Zeus this, Zeus that. Yeah, it's Ael Shaddai, Ael Elyon, Ael Olam, Ael Berit, Ael Beit Ael, Ael Roi. All these titles, all but one of them, uh, Berit is not, does not occur in the patriarchal stories, but all the others occur in the patriarchal stories where God says they didn't know me as Yahweh, I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? El Shaddai actually means Ale of the Mountain. Um, it doesn't mean Almighty, as it's translated in the King James Version. That was a guess, because they didn't know what Shaddai meant. But now, in the Ugaritic literature, has made it clear that it's the mountain, or a breast. Um, so that, as the KGV mistranslates it. It is used at Hebron, and Hebron only in the patriarchal stories by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's, it occurs some almost 20 times, but with all three of the patriarchs. Um, I give examples here. Genesis 17.1 is one of the places where that's used. El Elyon is only, uh, trans, is only uh, 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 occurs at one place, Jerusalem. Uh, it means God Most High, and that's correct. <clears throat> this is the story of Abraham and Melchizedek, or Melchizedek, uh, as we pronounce it, I guess, in Genesis 14. Um, El Melchizedek is seen as the priest of El Elyon. Um, uh, he's also the king of the city. Then there's El Olam, which is El Eternal, or El Everlasting. And again, the KGV correctly translate this well-known Hebrew word, Olam, meaning everlasting, or forever. Uh, and then it's used at Beersheba, and only at Beersheba, especially in the stories of Abraham and Abimelech in Genesis 21. But it's used several other places, several other locations in the Bible, but always at Beersheba. El Berit means Ale of the Covenant. Um, <clears throat> it's used not by the patriarchs, but in Judges 9, when Israel comes back into the Holy Land and they make a covenant with God at Shechem. So it's used at Shechem, but only at Shechem. Then there is, <laughs> this one is funny, Ale Beit Ale, which means Ale of Bethel. Beit Ale means house of God. There must have been a temple here at Bethel, uh, and Ale was the god of that. It's used in the um, Jacob story, Jacob's dream, okay, and only at Beit Ale, of course, Bethel. Uh, then there's Ale Roe. This one is rarer, but it's used with Hagar, or Hagar uh, names it that in the Negev desert when she's fleeing from uh, Sarah. It means uh, God sees me. Uh, this is just a, this is the same word in Psalm. Uh, no, no, it's not. <laughs> Sorry, it's a related word for shepherd, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not the same word. Okay, I want to go a little bit earlier in time. Moses is still outside Egypt, and he appears at the burning bush. He's curious about this burning bush. 
Moses said to God, if I come to, and God tells him, go to Egypt, uh, uh, tell them God is going to deliver them uh, out of Egypt and lead them out. Moses said to God, he wasn't so sure about this, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors, which would be Ale, right, uh, has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, not Ale. He said, I am who I am. He further said, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Now there's something confusing about this. If Moses were to say, I am has sent me, who's the I? Moses or God? So when he talks to Israel about I am, he has to use he is, right? He has to use the third person instead of the first person. The first person in Hebrew is Ehweh. That's what God says to Moses at the burning bush. I am Ehweh, using the first person singular. The initial uh, syllable uh, of Hebrew words is the person and gender, okay? Uh, it's a different than our usages here because it's a Semitic language. Arabic is the same. Um, so when Moses uses the name, he has to say he is which is Yahweh. The Yah, third person singular. The E, first, we say common singular because women would use it as well as men. Um, it, gen, it is not gender specific. The first person isn't. So third person, first person. This then becomes the name of God from there on. <clears throat> we can even say that Yahweh is causative meaning he causes to become and could refer to the idea of creation. So this is the biblical story of the origin of God's name for Israel. Israel and Israel only. The other nations did not use this name, Yahweh. Now I want to just do an aside on Jehovah. Some of you have probably been told this is the name of God. It is not. Okay, uh, in fact, it occurs nowhere in the Bible, nowhere. They say it occurs one time, but that's in the English, all right? The English is not what the biblical writers used. They used Hebrew. Jehovah is actually a combination of the consonants of Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, Y-H-W-H, okay? Because in Bible writing, they did not use vowels, they did not use vowels. They would just use consonants. Vowels were not added to the Hebrew until early Middle Ages, like the 7th century AD. That late. How were they remembered? Rabbis saying over and over and memorizing various parts of the Bible. And they would add these vowels as they spoke them, but nobody wrote them down. Only in the early Middle Ages did that happen. So we have what we call the consonantal text. The consonantal text for the name of God would just be Y-H-W-H. -H. Now there was another problem with this. The Israelites thought God's name, Yahweh, was so holy uh, after the Babylonian captivity that they did not pronounce that name, Yahweh. They did not say it out loud. They could see it in inscriptions, Y-H-W-H, only the consonants. But when they saw those four consonants, the tetragrammaton as it's called, they would use another word, Adonai, which means Lord. Okay? This is why in the New Testament even, God is called the Lord because of, of this they would use the consonants, Y-H-W-H, -H, with the vowels E-O-A. Look what that brings forth. And the, the W was in the Middle Ages was pronounced as a V, like German. So uh, Jehovah and a J uh, is the Latin uh, version of Y. And so they would have pronounced in Latin, Y, Yeho, Yehovah. But uh, in English, we pronounce it like an English J. <clears throat> So that's the origin of Jehovah. It is a con consonant, uh, consonants of Yahweh, the vowels of Adonai. It's not a word 
that's anywhere in the Hebrew language. Okay, <clears throat> so all this background that I've been giving you, if Ael equals Yahweh, and they, these names are interchangeable in the Old Testament, and Asherah was Ael's consort or wife, what happens with Asherah in Israel when the ancient biblical people used Yahweh interchangeably with Ael? Hmm, interesting developments some places. So Ael slash Yahweh, Ael Yahweh, and Asherah is the next stage of this lecture. <clears throat> and this is where it gets, uh, this is where you get the evidence. This incense stand, incense would have been uh, burned at the top here, was found at the site of Tanakh, north of Samaria. That's where this uh, yellow uh, Samaria would have been about here. Tanakh actually was over here, um, farther northeast um, than that X is. Um, but this incense stand came from there and dates to the 10th century, was excavated by some American team, uh, a very good one. And uh, this is an incredible discovery because it is a religious uh, item and therefore has religious scenes. But uh, this is what we call tier, uh, peer, tier 1, 2, 3, and 4, okay? And tier 1 and 3 represent Asherah, okay? Here you see Asherah with a typical Asherah hairstyle, uh, the sexual attributes exaggerated between two lions, which were her symbol at Ugarit and apparently here. Um, we will see many other images uh, of her like this. And up here, she's symbolized by a, a tree, a tree of life, out of which goats are standing on their hind legs and eating, like we saw that picture earlier of the woman giving the grain uh, to the standing goats. But there also, this is between two lions, like these here. So there's a similarity between these two tiers. So we think that these two tiers represent Asherah. Now, tier two and tier one, uh, tier four, also have a connection. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> uh, these are two cherubs. Huh? I'm going to show you how they are cherubs in a little bit. These are two cherubs. Uh, uh, human heads, lions or bulls' bodies, eagles' wings. They are often seen as guardians. Well, I'm going to show, show you uh, several uh, cherubs. There were cherubs after the tree of life were the most prominent theme uh, in ancient art. Everywhere. Big, little. Okay? Between these two, there's nothing. So many people think that may, maybe that's a representation of Yahweh, who didn't want himself represented by anything. Right? So maybe that's Yahweh. How is this fourth one Yahweh? Well, in 2 Kings 23, 11, it says Josiah removed the horses, okay, a horse up here, right, uh, that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun. Hmm. See the solar disk up here with wings <laughs> as it flies over the sky, uh, which they had set up at the entrance to the house of Yahweh, the temple. Um, the Bible talks about bad kings a lot, right? And purifying the temple quite often. Hezekiah, Josiah, people like that. Um, <clears throat> this is what they dismantled, the horses at the, uh, at the um, at gate, the entrance to the house of Yahweh. This is an important thing because it's got Asherah, Yahweh, Asherah, Yahweh. Most likely, there's no inscription which identifies it that way, but it fits the iconography we know elsewhere. Hundreds of uh, iconographic depictions. Okay, an aside on cherubs. If you aren't convinced about cherubs, I think you will be after the next few slides. Um, this is an, uh, a, um, a cherub in an Egyptian style, but it's actually Phoenician. 
Um, the Phoenician artistic style was a combination of Egyptian and Mesopotamian artistic styles. But you see a lion's body, eagle's wings, a human head. This is the a double crown of Egypt, for, of Egypt, for Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt. But it, it looks like a sphinx, doesn't it? Well, a sphinx is a cherub, <laughs> actually, uh, uh, with the, all those elements. Okay, so cherubs, the plural is cherubim, right? The im element again, or keruvim in Hebrew. Uh, the ch is really a k. Uh, <clears throat> after the tree of life, yeah, they were one of the most frequent iconographic symbols, uh, and so on. Okay, that's one. Hebrew, yeah, keruv. And if b is preceded by a vowel in Hebrew, we pronounce the b as a v, v, keruv. Ah, in Mesopotamia, they believed in big things. These, are, these two cherubs, which are guarding the ent entrance to a temple, um, and this one in the Louvre Museum, uh, uh, are both huge. This, um, statue, this depiction of a human is life-size compared with these. Interestingly, and most of the Mesopotamian samples... Um, well, interesting, they had five legs. One, two, three, four, five. It's not because they really had five legs. They want to show the cherub looking on the side. You see one, two, three, four. Or from the front, one, two. All right? So th they depicted five legs like that. But in between the legs of many of these cherubs is an inscription. And these inscriptions say, this cherub. It can't get uh, clearer than that. Okay, this is another uh, cherub from, uh, from uh, the Louvre. And in the inscription, you can see the inscription more clearly here, but in the inscription the, uh, in Akkadian or Babylonian, uh, Assyrian, the uh, word for cherub is karabu. They, they use the u, case ending for the nominative anyway, the, the subjective case. Um, karabu, well, that's the same as the Hebrew karuv. You see that? The same uh, consonants? Exactly. Um, the, the, the Babylonian hero Gilgamesh behind there is uh, uh, un, uh, unconnected with the cherub there who really looked, this looks like an Assyrian king <laughs> with that kind of beard coming down. Uh, also at the Louvre is this um, sort of quasi entryway uh, into a temple with even more of these. All of them have these inscriptions which describe them as cherubs. Um, I, I was able to go through Iraq once and south of Mosul, ancient Nineveh, um, at, at the site of Nimrud, by the way, which Agatha Christie's husband uh, conducted the excavations there. When I visited Nimrud, and I took this picture, they uh, showed me a house on the hill over there. So that's where Madame Malawan, because that was the name of her husband, um, the archaeologist, that's where she wrote her books. Yeah, a uh, great mystery novelist, right? of the 20th century. But you can see three, and there was actually a fourth one over here on this side of these large uh, cherubs, uh, again, within, with inscriptions uh, between the legs. And at Cyprus, they found two of these, uh, thrones of kings. Cherubim, uh, cherubim were seen as guardians. In the Bible, they're guardians, yeah. guarding the gate to the entrance of the Garden of Eden right? Guarding the uh, throne room of God in the temple, uh, uh, cherubim. Uh, two cherubim guarding the throne of this uh, uh, king of in Cyprus, uh, dating to about the 14th century BC. But the wings go back and reach around the king forming the, the back. Um, the Bible, in describing the Ark of the Covenant, talks about the wings touching Mm -hmm. And that's how they could touch. You don't have to have them kneeling over this ark and with 
so lying so low that the wings go over and touch like that. You can have the wings going around the back, forming the back of the chair. And the Bible, uh, the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible is, course, of course, a mercy seat. It's, it's a chair. It's, it's a seat where God would sit, and underneath it are the valuable uh, parts of, that make him uh, a, 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 their God. Okay, that's the aside on cherubs. So almost every person studying the ancient world accepts the idea that these are cherubs. All right? And there's really no, no doubt about it and because those inscriptions call them cherubs. At a site in southern Judah, down here on the borders between Edom and Judah, was an Israelite fortress called Arad. Um, almost totally excavated. Uh, there's an, um, a lower city all from the third millennium BC, so we don't pay any attention to it. But this is the fortress up here on top, dating to the 8th, 7th, and 6th centuries BC. If you were a bird and could look down in it, this is what it would look like. It contained the only excavated temple of Yahweh ever found until about five years ago. There's been another one um, that's near Jerusalem, by the way, about four miles from Jerusalem. But this small structure in the corner of this fortress where the soldiers stayed who defended the border <clears throat> was a temple. We see it in more de detail here. Um, this is a plan seen from above the entrance. And this is... A from roughly the same location, the entrance down here, courtyard. Why does the last letter always disappear here? Altar, all these things. Somehow that new program must be doing things. <clears throat> um, uh, there's a small altar, obviously not big enough for uh, a whole animal to be sacrificed, but there. There were storerooms behind, storerooms, courtyard, altar, entrance, and then an entrance here into a broad room. Uh, back here, which could be seen as the holy place. Now, don't think that ancient Israelites had to make all temples look exactly alike. They obviously didn't. Even the one that has been recently discovered is somewhat different. But this has benches where you could leave your, some gifts that weren't to be sacrificed. And then a few stairs, two incense altars, and two standing stones that are, well, we'll show them later. Yeah, the standing stones right here, one here, one here, the two incense altars right there. That would be like the Holy of Holies. Standing stones often are, 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 are um, replacements for divinities, uh, symbolic uh, uh, things of, uh, for divinities. And the duality of them right here is very interesting. In fact, Sioni Zevet, in his book that I, uh, the last book on the, that page back here, talks about the dualness of Israelite religion the duality of it because it's, uh, well, as you will see, it's uh, quite prominent. Yeah, here's a closer view of the two incense altars and the two standing stones. These items, by the way, have been moved to the museum, Israel Museum, and these are replacements, but they look exactly like the ancient ones that were involved. The two standing stones, one larger, one smaller. And at this site, over 100 inscriptions were found written on pottery. These are all Hebrew language, Hebrew script, and when there are names there, Hebrew names. That is, they had Yahweh or Ale in the uh, God's names in the uh, in the names on the inscriptions. Also, two potsherds were found with names. These names are the names of priestly families. In, uh, in the Bible, Paschur and Meremot, <clears throat> and part of Chronicles, and um, I'm having to click this several times. I wonder if it's, it, uh, Gumi, it may be, okay, yeah, okay. 
All right. Remember we saw the, on this incense altar from Tanakh um, what I was calling Asherah right here. Do you see how similar they are to these pillar figurines? Thousands of pillar figurines have been found in Judah. Pillar figurines because the bottom part is pillars. They could set them up like that. <clears throat> Often uh, holding their breasts like these are. Um, if you go through, through the old city of Jerusalem and look at antiquities stores, uh, oftentimes pillar figurines will be uh, uh, advertised there as, uh, as, as being sold. Uh, you'd have to pay thousands of dollars for, <laughs> for one, though, because they're very famous. Um, but 3,000 of these, over 3,000, have been found in Judah, dating to the 8th and 7th centuries B.C., um, and over 700 alone in the Jerusalem area. Um, <clears throat> yeah, mostly they come from tombs. That's why they're preserved so well. All right, what's the biblical evidence for Asherah? And we aren't done with the archaeological yet, by the way. Look at 1 Kings 15, 13. Asa removed his mother Maaka from being queen mother. Hmm, she did something bad. Because she had made an abominable image for Asherah, he cut down her image and burned it in the Wadi Kidron. That's the Wadi, the valley just to the east of Jerusalem. This was probably a wooden carving made from a, originally a symbolic tree of life that you could cut down and burn. Um, so uh, this was a political error made by the queen mother. Um, uh, and... This probably was a grove of trees that they translated this as again. But now we now know it's Asherah. And then in 2 Kings 21, 7, Manasseh set a carved image of Asherah in the house of Yahweh, right there plunk in the, in the temple. Again, probably made of wood. Maybe a tree of life? We don't know. 2 Kings 23, 7, uh, Josiah, good King Josiah, thank God for him, broke down the houses of the male temple prostitutes that were in the house of Yahweh, where the women did weaving for Asherah. In the house of God, women did uh, made carpets and so on uh, in the name of Asherah. So biblical texts place Asherah smack dab in the temple of Yahweh at times. I have a friend, Larry Steger is his dead, bless him, he's dead now. Um, but he was the one who asked that question. Was Yahweh lonely <laughs> that he needed Asherah in the temple with him? Mm, having problems with this again. Maybe the batteries run down. I'm using it too much. Okay. But the clincher lies here, out in the Sinai Desert. <clears throat> Barely in the Sinai Desert. You can't see the X here, or is it, has it moved? It's just on the other side of the border from Israel in Sinai, very close to the border. And in fact, the caravanserai, which is on top of this hill, looking like a breaching whale um, in the desert, is the era, ancient caravanserai where people going from Samaria down to the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba, would overnight uh, safely on top of that hill. This is a picture looking down on the ruins at Kuntilat Ajrud. The entrance was right through here. You can see rooms where they might stay and a courtyard in the middle where their animals could be kept safely. But these plastered walls, and you can see how white they are through here, these plastered walls, and the jars in the side rooms here, there are several of these jars, held inscriptions and graffiti, uh, almost doubling the amount of uh, inscriptions, ancient Hebrew inscriptions that had been found here to four. Some of the graffiti. <laughs> I like their Mohawk hairdos, eh? Um, and their polka dots and plaids and so on. Um, Israelites worshiping. How do we know they're worshiping? They're in the stance of prayer. Ancient stance of prayer was hands up uh, and out, uh, sort of blessing, uh, 
eyes open and looking up toward heaven like this, the stance of prayer. uh, In Christian, early Christian art, these are called orants, O-R-A-N-T-S. Orant, people who pray, yeah? The Latin word for prayer is orare or something like that. Anyway, these people are all looking in one direction. What are they looking at? The next scene that was connected to it. This is the original, okay? Uh, this is a um, drawing of it. A woman sitting on a chair playing a harp. And two figures that are humanoid, not really human. Um, uh, they both have tails. Um, female, male. Okay? Big head like bovine. S- smaller head, but maybe leonine uh, ears. And legs that are not human. Um, maybe bovine, maybe um, uh, leonine, we don't know, but dressed like humans. The faces are not human. The heads are not human. They have strange crowns. And through the crown of the male is an inscription, almost as if it's part of the crown. The inscription reads right here, I bless you by Yahweh of Samaria and by his Asherah. Uh, this quite, has caused quite a sensation. And there are three other inscriptions that use the same blessing formula. I bless you by Yahweh and by his Asherah. They would give the name. Instead of you, it would be uh, the name <clears throat> that was involved. Uh, so there are a total of four inscriptions from Judah dating to the 8th and 7th centuries which give this formula. And the uh, singer here is interesting because the Assyrian inscriptions uh, take as captives hundreds of male and female singers. So apparently the ancient Israelites were known as great singers. But this may be Ael Yahweh and this may be uh, his wife, as some people thought. Okay, conclusions. The patriarchal God was much the same deity as Canaanite Ale. Same titles, Shaddai, so on. Um, He was very similar. He was worshipped by them in local manifestations with local titles, Hebron, Beersheba, Jerusalem, so on. Different titles. In the Bible and the the Israelite divine name Yahweh was revealed to Moses at the burning bush. Okay? So later in the history. Patriarchal times, Yahweh was not known. That's that's what Exodus 6.3 says. Straightforward. And uh, so Ael was their God in the patriarchal times. Yahweh became the national, the name for the national God of Israel. But Ale continued to be used there as well. Yahweh was identified with Ale, and both names were used throughout the Old Testament. Throughout. They go throughout, even the Babylonian captivity. Among the Canaanites, Ale had a consort or wife named Asherah. Many biblical texts, about 30, describe Israelites as worshiping Asherah, even in, as we saw, in the temple itself. Okay? The Bible writers didn't like this, obviously, okay? There is no denying, I believe, her association with Ael Yahweh in several biblical texts and stories. <clears throat> they are connected somehow. Her symbols were the tree of life, like the menorah and the lioness. She was a fertility goddess in Canaan, usually depicted with ex- exaggerated sexual attributes, There are thousands of archaeological manifestations of her throughout Judah. Even in Jerusalem, some have been found very close to the temple, in fact. These include figurines, inscriptions, incense altars, graffiti, etc. And I've showed you all four of these uh, here. There is no denying, I believe, Asherah's religious importance to many Israelites. To all of them? No. But to many, yes. In fact, uh, most of us archaeologists would say that the majority of people in Israel thought of God as having a wife. The majority. 
It was kind of a folk religion, if I can put it that way, um, an easy one, and a nice one for women to think about, too. <clears throat> So there's, I, I think there's no denying Asherah's religious importance to many Israelites. But these were certainly not the biblical writers. They wrote consistently, negatively about her. In fact, that's why the prophets spoke or wrote the way they did. Why? Because this kind of thing was going on. This was not a monotheism. This was a, a, a duotheism, if I can put it that way, using... Latin instead of Greek, but anyway. Um, so there's a reason the Bible writers wrote that way, the way they did. Um, books have been written about this. If, if you're really interested in this, you might be interested in the stories from ancient Canaan by Michael Coogan, Mark Smith. The one where they ha have Mark Smith involved is much more expensive than the other one because it's newer, unfortunately, and has more information. <laughs> Um, but also Bill Deaver's book is written for ordinary people, uh, to educated ordinary people, uh, which he entitles, Did God Have a Wife? Okay, so probably among many Israelites, yes, he did. But among the biblical writers, no. Okay, and we are left with the Bible as the basis of our faith. Okay? Thank you so much. Let's see, is this one on? Yeah. Thank you so much, Larry. And we can take some questions for a few minutes here in the audience and online. Okay, let's go right over here to start off. Thank you so much for coming. This is fabulous. Now, uh, over the last approximately a year, uh, a, an archaeologist by the name of Scott Stripling, maybe you know that name, he, he claims that he has found a red, I mean a lead inscription uh, near Mount Ebal, which is related to uh, Joshua's altar. He claims that he's found Joshua's altar. Can you enlighten us anything okay. about that? Okay, I've, I've read an article by him, actually, uh, on this find. <clears throat> it's not, strictly speaking, an archaeological find. It, it is said to have come from there. Uh, but it's a fairly good thing. Uh, he, uh, Mount Abel uh, has, apparently, an, uh, a large altar of sacrifice, which the original excavator... Um, whom I knew well before he passed away oh, 10 years ago or so, um, claimed was the altar the Israelites uh, set up when they entered Canaan uh, and conquered the cities and they met there and made the covenant or renewed the covenant with God. Um, <clears throat> so he claims, Stripling claims that this came from that place there. If so, it would be dated to, oh, the late 12th century or something like that, which that uh, altar, and it probably was an altar, um, uh, dates. I'm not saying necessarily it was exactly as uh, the excavator thought it was, but um, I was not able to make sense of that inscription, okay? And I think he was being a little bit liberal with the way he was mm, interpreting it. I'd be careful with it. Did I see another hand here? Did you have one, Norman? There are frequent references in the Old Testament about Israel, quotes, backsliding from worshiping God to taking on the God of the... Canaanites around them. This combination you mentioned where they have Asheroth and El together a lot and yet sometimes separate, wouldn't that just sort of be an invitation from a practical point of view for them to be backsliding since that was part of their language? Was it confusing is really what you're asking, right? Um, the carry-on of the name Ale 
and he, uh, Asher was connected with Ale. Was this confusing? Absolutely it was. And um, bad things happen when there's confusion. Yeah. And sometimes, how does God work? I think God works through what we already know and have and slowly gives us more um, as time goes by. Um, yeah, it was confusing. And there are confusing things today for us, too. Yeah, it was. I've often wondered about that. He has a follow-up. Okay. And then we'll go Carla and then wait in the front there. An additional question. I am told that the God of Genesis 1-1 is plural form. And some people want to say, well, that's sort of evidence that there's a trinity involved. Do you find evidence in that? Um, in the whole rest of the Old Testament, there is no reference to, you know, three elements right away. Yet, New Testament, yes. Old Testament, no. Um, let us make man in our image, for instance, things like that. That's in verse 26 or something like that in Genesis 1 as well. Yes, it is Elohim in Genesis 1-1, but it's Elohim through all of Genesis 1. Um, Yahweh isn't mentioned at all uh, in Genesis 1. Um, most of us interpret that use of the first person plural to be in the sense of the divine assembly. In the Ugaritic texts, in texts from Mesopotamia, Egypt, whenever their divine assemblies met together and they made pronouncements, it was always in the first person plural to represent the group aspect of the divine assembly. Now in the Bible, the divine assembly would have been God, the angels. Okay, and so uh, I think they were using the ideas of the common writing style around them. When God makes an important pronouncement like, let us make man, humans, in our image, that's an important pronouncement. And so they might have used formulaic expressions of how uh, people, other people, saw things. And I, I, I have to say that the Hebrew language was closely related to the languages around them. They under, would have understood Phoenician. They would have understood Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic, uh, which was, is very, very close to Hebrew. Uh, dialects is really what they were, not languages so much. So they knew those cultures and those literary elements. They knew them. And in order to uh, use the values of the people around them, okay, who also knew those, they would use those literary. That's one explanation. I can't provide proof for that, though. I have two questions. One is about last night's presentation. How did Herod get the money to build all those palaces? And, <laughs> and uh, then the second question has to do with goats. Okay, um, well, let me take one at a time, okay? Um, Herod, how did he get the money? He taxed a lot, and he forced people into doing things for him. He also did good things for the Jews. He built that temple for them. Uh, he was half Jewish. They were very much appreciative. of The greatest temple in the Roman Empire at the time. This was an incredible scoop for them, uh, if I can put it that way. But um, yeah, he had to tax them. But he probably got money from uh, people in Rome who wanted him to be friends, like Octavian or Caesar Augustus. Uh, he wanted the background. Those emperors were only emperors because people out there in the hinterlands were supporting them, just like yeah, U.S. political parties, and we're thinking very seriously about those right now. <laughs> okay, can I go to the goat snacks? Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember which work of literature this is. It was one probably from the 17th century in which an incredulous person is shocked at the reference to goats as being an association everybody understood immediately to be associated with the devil and with, with Satan. So um, we, we have the popular phrase, separate the sheep from the goats. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the, the historical metaphor of goats. 
Okay. Um, almost every herd had both sheep and goats. Jesus used that in his parable about the separating the goats from the sheep. Goats were black. Symbolically, what does that mean? Yeah, not so good. Unfortunately, we see that same thing in our own culture sometimes. But um, goats were also uh, the scapegoat is seen that way. On the other hand, there was the good goat. And goats could be sacrificed just as easily as sheep. Yeah, just uh, as easily. Well, yeah. That's what I mean. So, uh, there, in the Bible, there really isn't a difference, except they're black. And so maybe if you have some bad thing associated with them, you connect them with goats. But I would much rather be a goat than a sheep. I'm sorry. Goats are intelligent. Yeah. So there you go. And Alvin has a question. Okay, we'll go wait and then Alvin. Thank you. Um, first of all, the reference she made to that can also go back in the metaphysical world to Pan, God Pan in the tarot oh, the deck. Goat, yeah. Because Pan, Pan's energy is not like cloven hooves and a satanic foreboding thing mm -hmm. uh, unless you're repressed and are being held back from being a natural version of yourself, then suddenly he becomes this monstrous thing. I just thought yeah. I'd mention that. Good, good. But, Thank you. Yeah. But I, I, uh, I wanted to uh, ask you for a clarification. Did you uh, touch on the exact relationship between Baal and, and Hadad? Are they father and son? Okay. Baal is a title. Wives called their husbands Baal. Okay. Lord. All okay. Right. Ma uh, slaves called their masters Baal. All right. Or Adonai. The two words are interchangeable, actually, Adonai and Baal. Okay. So uh, because Hadad was the god of Ugarit, he was their lord, okay. their Baal. I was just wondering, because when you mentioned Yom from the sea as yeah. being as kind of an antagonistic figure. Oh, right? yes. They had, they had a big battle. I have to tell you about this battle a little bit. This is fun. This is a fun story. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the divine assembly was meeting and they were being threatened by uh, the god Yam, the god of the sea. Right. And he was threatening them with death. The sea water is salt. If it takes over the world, everything dies. That's right. right? So everybody was afraid. And all the <clears throat> gods' heads were down on their knees. Baal comes in. He's the god of the storm, fresh water, right? And also an executive god who marches forth. He's this dynamic kind of god with a, right. a thunderbolt and all of that. Um, <clears throat> he comes into this assembly and he says, and this is almost Psalm 24, he says, lift up, O gods, your heads. So, lift up. Uh, in right. fact, that's how the Hebrew is organized in Psalm 24. <clears throat> lift up, O gates, your heads. Right. Um, but in the Ugaritic literature, it's lift up, O gods, your heads. your heads. He's going to be victorious. So he marches forth and enters into personal battle with Yam, his brother. Ale doesn't care who wins this, actually. That's strange, but it's the case in the Ugaritic literature anyway. And they have this big battle. Well, Yam is noted for his big maw, yeah, his mouth that opens wide, sort of like the monster in all those judgment, last judgment scenes, medieval, you know, with the monster and the Behemoths people being and shepherded those, yeah. into. Yeah, he opens his mouth, he's going to swallow Baal. Well, Baal is the god of the storm. He calls up the wind, <laughs> and the wind comes yes. and blows Yam up like a balloon until boom, he bursts. And so Baal is victorious and everybody is happy. And that's the myth behind Baal and why the Israelites, because fresh water then comes to water their fields, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why the Israelites were really tempted to worship Baal. Well, I was wondering if there was a connection between that, because you mentioned in that same context, uh, you, uh, there was a reference you made that included Zeus. And Zeus, in the, their tradition, Zeus and his brother Neptune are at odds. And Neptune is the god of the sea. Yeah. So I was wondering, is that where that came from? Um, uh, 
There is a lot of evidence that Greek mythology did grow out of Canaanite mythology. The, the gods, what they, what, what they were god over, are very similar. Not always, but right. they are very similar. Um, the names aren't precisely anything. Kuranos means heaven, of right. course, and Ael dwells in heaven. But anyway, um, there are similarities, but they probably came, like the alphabet, from Phoenicia to Greece. Okay. I was just curious yeah. about that. Thank you very much, Larry. That's a really fascinating presentation at a level that uh, we don't often enough <laughs> get, get to. Um, but I, I was just curious about your reference to the biblical writers, and I wasn't clear whether you meant the prophets who were writing or whether you meant the translators. And within that context, where did this notion begin to disappear of the consort? I mean, it, it was there in the, in the society, uh, fully developed, as you have demonstrated quite convincingly, but it clearly disappeared. Where, yes. how, what was the process by which that disappeared? And can you comment on that? You know, the Babylonian captivity was a major transition for Israel. Um, they lost a lot of things at that time that were not so good. Jeremiah made it clear what these problems were, and they, there's evidence that they used Jeremiah to correct how things were. Ezekiel uh, uh, um, says the same thing, and so on. Um, I don't, Asherah does not occur in anywhere after the Babylonian captivity, either in archaeological depictions, figurines, or anything like that. Um, and in the biblical texts, no, that's where it ends. Are there any other questions in person or online? Dina. Those standing stones at a rod were unhewn stones, and I remember, I don't, I assume that they are replicas, so the originals are also unhewn stones. Is that? Notable. I remember that they were not supposed to make an altar of hewn stone. So, is there a relationship there somehow? There, uh, there. You all heard her questions. The standing stones at Arad, and she's visited Arad uh, <coughs> with, with us, um, were made of unhewn stones, and she also realizes that altars were supposed to be made of unhewn stones. Um, Beersheba has an altar made of hewn stones. And Amos, if you remember the passage, it says, don't go to Bethel, don't go to Beersheba. Um, and it doesn't say why particularly, but maybe because of that. And also on that altar at Beersheba, Beersheba was the carving of a snake. Mm. Snake was seen as holy in Canaanite uh, uh, culture and religion because it sloughs its skin and uh, gets a new life. So, so it's a symbol of life and life eternal, actually. It's reborn in a sense. So snakes were... That's why the Nehushtan, the, um, the snake... Uh, that Moses made in the wilderness. That's why King Hezekiah, I mean, this is 600 years afterwards. In the words of Indiana Jones, this ought to be in a museum. Don't destroy it, right? It needs to be in a museum. Uh, that uh, Nehushtan, instead, Hezekiah destroys it because people were worshiping it, the serpent. And that came from, again, the Canaanite connection with, uh, uh, yeah, the Canaanite remembrance of Ale, Asher, and so on, and Baal, uh, yeah. So, uh, and Dana further mentions that the standing stones were natural stones, and that's correct. And you may remember, Dana, the uh, standing stone that we found at Tel el Amari, where we excavated, was also a natural stone. <clears throat> now, these stones, limestone, could be natural stones like that could be made by the dripping water in, in caves. Not just stalactites, but the formation of these smooth kinds of stones. They look very smooth, but they're natural. Yeah. Any final questions? 
your response there brings up a question that I have, and maybe we can end here then. Um, I remember reading some years ago with Joseph Campbell, where he spoke about a unique twist within the biblical narrative of the serpent being more of the deceiver and being more evil than what he saw within the other uh, descriptions. But I never followed up on that close enough. Is that true with what you've seen as far as the way I that haven't it's... read a lot of Joseph Campbell. Okay. Um, where did you... This is a, this is a hippie writer. Um, uh, Joseph Campbell. It compared cultural... Uh, Mythology, myth, famous, yeah. yeah. Well, not just mythologies, but legends and mm -hmm. cultural uh, etymologies and so on like that. Very intriguing writer. I used to go to bookstores in Harvard Square looking at these. All of them had Joseph Campbell books prominently displayed in the early 70s. But, uh, yeah, that's interesting that your generation would also uh, be interested in it. Um, uh, what he has to say is serious. I mean, he was a serious writer. So, and indeed, serpents are seen as evil in many cultures, many cultures. Asian cultures kill every s snake they can find, whether it's good or bad. They don't know. Mm -hmm. story of the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life that Satan mm. disguised himself as a serpent. Yeah. And, you know, to, in order yeah. to have his way with, uh, with Eve. And at, at the same time, if you go further east into India uh, and you discover the uh, stories of the Kundalini, the awakening of the psycho-spiritual part of us at the base of the coccyx of the spine mm. is like a serpent climbing. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, at the medical symbol, the, yeah, they, the, it's a snake. Right. So it's not necessarily a, a cut and dry positive or negative. It's yeah. perhaps the, both. The medical uh, uh, symbol, of course, I think comes from uh, the Nehushtan, if it's, if it's biblical. But uh, I, I want to say something about the Garden of Eden and the serpent in the Garden of Eden. The biblical Hebrew just says serpent. There's no mention whatsoever about the devil or the Satan. In the Old Testament, Satan is always a title. It's, it's not a name. Um, yeah, there's no mention of it being... In fact, it says it was really intelligent, right? It was crafty. But the, the Genesis 1 is making a word play there too. The word for crafty is arum. The next verse talks about Adam and Eve being both naked and they weren't ashamed. The word for naked is arum as well. <laughs> so naked being a symbol of naivety and innocence and all of that whereas the serpent was crafty and could come underground. So the, the, there is a connection somehow to the serpent being evil. Of course he was condemned to go on the ground and to be killed by humans uh, by trampling them on the head. Yeah, the curse. Yeah, I'm, I'm wise, like or just, serpent. or just plum evil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Serpent, yeah. Sky, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, thank you so much. We have one more question. You mentioned the uh, war between the gods in the Ugaritic tradition. There's lots of wars between the gods or backing different human sides as they did in the, um, the Iliad, in the Greek gods. Yeah, you know, the so. Titans. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and there's also the sense of the Manichaeans that there must be opposing opposites in every culture. Mm. And so I'm, is there any evidence that the Hebrew culture had that sense of opposing opposites if they didn't really have a concept of a personal Satan. And how do you deal with the book of Job? Yeah. Oh boy, you're asking a question. I need a whole, I need three whole classes to do this one. Um, uh, you, you, you can, um, you can personify the idea of evil as well. I think evil is in individuals, too. It's not just from outside that evil comes. I think it comes from within us, too. Um, 
and maybe Harry Potter says it best. There's a dark side and a, <laughs> and, and, and a good side to us. Or that's Star Wars, isn't it? Uh, Darth Vader. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, all these um, popular movies and books actually explore this concept of where is evil and why does it come. Um, the Bible explains it in, uh, as, well, the New Testament as Satan. Yeah. They did come out of the unconscious. Yeah. You only be happy. Yeah. It, 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 but Carla, I don't think it exists as clearly in the Old Testament as it is in the New. Um, the Satan is part of God's court in Job and where he appears again. He appears several places actually. Also in the Balaam story as the angel, he's called an angel, the Satan appears before the donkey and causes the donkey to go to the side and hurt Balaam's leg. Um, it's used also in judgment scenes in the Old Testament. Um, one of their favorite curses is, may a Satan arise against you in the, in the gate. Right? The gate is the place of judgment. Uh, so that can be a human being. That's um, all that word, Satan. So it, it really we should think of it as accuser. It occurs also in the book of Zechariah. Um, where uh, the Satan is standing next to God saying, hey, this guy, this Jewish leader is evil. Get rid of him. Well, God rejects the Satan's advice and saves. Is it Zerubbabel or something like that? Um, there. So, and that uses the definite article there too. It's not a name. It's the accuser. So, and it could be seen as the heavenly accuser. You could see it as someone who works for God, finding the people who are evil and saying, God, you need to punish this person. <laughs> That's, well, that was the big king of Babylon. But you, um, you, you, you have this idea um, of the, of the um, working for God in Job. Right? Uh, God says, hey, do what you want to do with Job, just don't make it too bad. Right? And he then goes along and does it that way. And, and if you read the dialogues, whom does Job uh, uh, say bring, has brought this up on him in the dialogues? Consistently, God. Consistently. Read the dialogues. I know most of us don't read the dialogues. They tend to be repetitive. But Job, especially the speeches of Job, he's very angry, Job is, against God for doing this because he is innocent. He has not sinned. The idea, Job is written against the idea that, hey, if you're a good boy, you're going to get good Christmas present. If you're a bad boy, you won't get any Christmas present. It's, it's almost like that. We call it Deuteronomic theology in Old Testament theology where the good guy gets blessed by God, the bad guy gets cursed by God. Well, Job was obviously cursed. Therefore, the friends are right in Deuteronomic theology that Job has done evil. But Job knows better. He hasn't done evil. Therefore, he's angry with God for being unjust. And he says that specifically. So, yeah, it's, it's more complex. Read it, and read it slowly. Re read the dialogues. Thank you so much, Dr. Herr. Could we give him a warm uh, thank you? <laughs> and thank you, lecture committee team, for making this possible. Thank, thank you, Gumi and Andrew and everybody that helped out with sound. And I will have a short prayer to end our time together, and we can go out and enjoy this beautiful Seattle fall day. Dear God in heaven, we are thankful for the work of people like Dr. Herr that makes the Old Testament world come to life, and there is so much to explore and learn and be curious about. 
continue to give us that interest and humility and honesty to seek the truth the best that we can. Be with us now, and we pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.